your story and your message and your truth to the world that Jesus has come and that we can have life in him. Lord, we're all your servants, and so whatever purpose you have for every person in this class watching these videos, Lord, let your will be done. Let us glorify you. Let us impact the world for for your sake in these last days. Lord, I pray for everyone um, who's watching this and who's listening that you would just give us the knowledge, uh, give us wisdom to know how to use the gift of words um, to use it well, to use it for your purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, uh, when you're a Christian journalist, you really want every single thing that you write to be accurate. You always want to be accurate as a journalist, as a writer, as a Christian. But when something goes into print, it's um, it needs to be rock solid, and that's almost you almost have to be OCD. You almost have to be just is that the right name spelling? Is that the name of the church? You have to question everything. I guess that's the easiest way. I'm always questioning everything, so it comes naturally to me. And if you're a question asker, good for you. You'll probably be a good writer. <laughs> um, so every piece of information has to be accurate. So if you look, um, we have vigilance against errors. You can read all of that. But let's go to the very, the second page on the bottom where it says readbacks. This is something that, well, other professional news outlets might not do readbacks, we do. And that's something where after we've taken notes or after we've written a story, we'll ask the source, is this right? This is the quote that I have for you. Or we might even mail them, email them the, the story with their quotes and with the information. And then they can look at every single thing you've written and say, yes, that's good. Or, oh, no, it wasn't in 1988, it was 1998. Or, you know, and they can fix things. So that is always... You're always welcome to do that. We want the churches to know that, that we're partnering with them and that we're not going to twist their words. And that there's not going to be any surprises. We don't want them to have any surprises in the stories. Um, and it's sometimes when someone is telling you a story, depending on how they relate the information, some people are really good at telling you a story in a chronological way. First this happened, then this happened, then this happened. But some people... They don't think that way, and so they're going all over the place while they're telling you the story. Ping, 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 ping. First they're in 1988, then they're in 1998, but they forgot to tell you. And then they're back in 2014, but they didn't mention that. So it's really easy just to get confused. Um, even You can even play the tape and see, well, that's what they said is what I put, but that's not what they meant, right? So it's nice to just send them back um, the piece or even to just say, okay, so let me get this right. In 1988, you came to this church. In 1998, you started this ministry. In 2005, your son got saved. And you know what I mean? That's just a sanity check. I like to call that sanity check. And sanity checks are good. And they don't mean that you've done anything wrong. Um, so there's a, there's a nice quote from Ron F. Smith about um, double-checking facts, that competent reporters do that. And if you find an error great. That is your job. Um, and if somebody says, oh no, that's not what year it was, don't take it personally. Don't be worried. Just say, oh good, I'm glad we caught that. There's more uh, under the accuracy checklist. These are just basic things that you want to check for every single story you do. Um, and at the very bottom it says, please give us the contact info so that if something, a question comes up on deadline that we can just call your source directly and say, you know, hi, Tom Roscoe, were you ordained in 1998 or 1988? You know, and we can just double check those things. Okay, on page 26, we have research for Cabri Chapel Magazine assignment. Research is so key to getting a good story, to writing a good in-depth story, even if it's about a church that you attend because you may not know everything that the Lord's doing or all the nuances of something. So never assume that you already understand before you do your research. Um, so this assignment is to help you write a piece that could be used in the magazine. You have two options. One option is a Calvary highlight, 100 to 400 words. It's really not that long. It should be a nice, easy piece. Um, an evergreen piece, that means we could run it this year, next year, it's probably not going to matter. 
about a ministry or outreach done by a Calvary Chapel church anywhere in the world. Um, ideally, it would be something that another Calvary Chapel could model and do a ministry similar to that, but it doesn't have to be, right? We would like the ministry to be unique, not a VBS, because everybody has a VBS, right? Not an Easter service, everybody has that. Operation Christmas Child, we might do one of those every couple years, but you get the point. Um, good candidates for a unique ministry that other churches could replicate would be like a skating ministry, skateboarding ministry, uh, creative community outreaches, like an art festival, a music festival, some kind of outreach in a park like that. Ministry to a specific group, such as the disabled, the deaf, the blind, the elderly, the grieving, um, or Bible studies or outreaches for first responders. Uh, blended family fellowships or Bible studies, adoption or foster ministry. These are all things that probably there's lots of Calvaries in the country who could do a ministry like that, but maybe they've just never thought of it or they don't know how to go about it. So that's one of the exciting things we can do as a writer is just find out and put that information out there. So, so here's um, some things to keep in mind. Make sure the Calvary is... Uh, uh, at Calvary Chapel affiliate on this calvarycca.org. Um, first, go to the church website to learn as much as you can about the ministry. Um, you can use info from the website for your article. It's nice if you can reword it a little bit so it's not word for word for word cut and pasted from their website. Um, look for the contact person. Send them a short list of questions or call, call the church to get their email. Say you're doing research for Calvary Chapel magazine and would like to find out more about the ministry please do not promise that we are doing a story because right now you're just researching, right? Um, and it may be that it's a wonderful thing, but maybe we did it two years ago and you don't know that. So we, I never promise anything until I know that I know that we are putting a story in. So to make it more three-dimensional and more interesting and more helpful, try to get a quote from the founder or someone whose life was touched by the ministry um, sometimes they have a newsletter, sometimes they can just email you some thoughts. Um, good questions are like, why did it start? What fruit has come out of it? What have they learned? Some challenges or blessings of the ministry. Um, if it's, I always like to let people know, if we're going to run a story on your ministry, we'll let you know. And that way they're not waiting uncertainly or, or they just assume it is going to go because they're excited. I always say, we're, we'll let you know, and you'll even get to see it before it goes in. Um, and that builds up trust. Ask about a scripture that's relevant. Write the article. Check for grammar and spelling. Um, and make sure you have the contact person's name, phone number, email. The second one, if, if, if you're more of a personal testimony kind of a writer, that's more exciting for you. Um, would be to use the guidelines for the personal testimony on page 17. Maybe you've already written the personal testimony because we had an assignment like that earlier. Um, make sure that the person attends a Calvary Chapel church or other affiliate. Um, um, send me a brief paragraph about them, what church they attend, what you plan to talk about in the story, what angle you're going to take. Um, if you're not sure what angle, you could say, I think it might be this, but it could be this. That's fine. Um, uh, be prepared to ask them for a, a sharp picture of their face. Um, and if you did a personal testimony story and it meets these requirements, you can always revise it and use it for this assignment. All right. Any questions about those assignments? Now, if you are really interested in writing something that could hopefully be used, I have a couple ideas for things that we'd like for the next issue. So if that's exciting to you. If that's too much pressure for you, that's fine. But if that's kind of exciting, if you need a goal, I do, to push other things aside to make something a priority. So see me after if you would like an assignment. Um, okay. All right. Any questions about the researching? Um, we, is this all right? Is this uh, for option one? Does that include? Uh, Christian Brothers Transition Program. Okay. Yeah. Would? Okay. Yeah. Right. As long as the ministry is closely tied to a Calvary Chapel, All right. it might not be within the grounds of the Calvary Chapel, but if the Calvary Chapel like sends people there regularly to help, or there's people that went there and are now part of Calvary, and are, as long as it has a really nice close connection with a local Calvary Chapel, then it's 
it's fair game. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about writing style. And we, we really have a lot to talk about with writing style, and I don't want anyone to get overwhelmed. These are just things that will help you no matter what kind of writing you're doing. Um, writing style is such a broad term. It's kind of like the way you write something. Um, there is such a thing as a style guideline, and that might be the Chicago Manual of Style or the Associated Press um, style book. And these are like, you capitalize this, you don't capitalize this, you spell out these numbers, you do this in a date line. Um, it's just the, the particular way that something is formatted. But then also, writing style is about the way you use words in a story, the way that you're telling the story. <coughs> and every kind of writing has a different style, like poetry has a different style, novel writing has a different style. Um, documentary writing, screenwriting, they all have different styles. So, um, but there are some general guidelines that really, um, that you can learn that will help your writing be better no matter who you are, no matter what kind of writing you're doing. A really good book, if you're interested in, in being a better writer, is Elements of Style, and I, that's at the end of that paragraph there. Elements of Style by Strunk and White, it's, it's super valuable. It talks about things like how to make your dialogue sound natural, how to be precise and not go on and on, how to combine your senses, how to keep your reader with you, um, how to have a natural tone but still keep it interesting. It's a great, it's very practical. It's short, sweet, to the point. Um, every writer should have one. It doesn't matter what edition. Um, if you want to brush up on Associated Press style, there's a lot online now. Um, but they do a new edition of the Associated Press style book, AP style book, every couple of years. Um, for our purposes, I don't really mind which year you use. <coughs> if you're going to be submitting stuff to other magazines or newspapers, you probably want to get the most recent version of that. Okay, so this, this gets kind of fun. So general style for journalistic writing, brevity. Brevity. Saying something in the fewest words possible, but still keeping it interesting and getting your point across. Short and what? Short and sweet. And in journalism, those two words always go together. Short and sweet, right? Um, and you have to think of it this way. Since the magazine is literally paying to print every word that you write, every word has to count. Every word has to be important, essential to telling the story. Every paragraph needs to have a job, right? Um, so after you write your first draft, and I read a really good book by Stephen King on writing. I don't enjoy his genre. I can't read any of his stuff. But he knows a lot about constructing sentences and things like that. And he talks about when you're in the mode of writing and you're creating and you're, you're sort of trying to get the picture out and tell the story, don't be an editor in your head. Your first role is really just to generate those ideas to convey something, right? I'm telling you a story. I'm telling you about this ministry. I'm telling you about this person, how Jesus saved them. And I'm trying to get the most powerful, the most interesting things down on paper, right? And so don't in your mind go, well, is that the shortest way to say that? You're not even thinking that, right? But when you come back, for your second look at it, and everybody has to come back. Do not assume you will ever get it perfect the, right, the first time. No writer, not even the professionals do. So a good writer knows that they're going to go back and clean things up and tighten things up and polish it up a little bit. So just let yourself be free the first time that you're writing to really get the things that you feel are the heart of the Lord, the most important things. Just get those in there, right? Then you're going to come back and put on your editing glasses. Right? And you're going to come back and go, okay, what can we kill? I know it's a strong word. What can we kill? What can we cut to keep the good stuff there but take away the stuff that's just going to clutter it up, right? Because the more words you have, the more your reader has to process and consume to try to get your message. So if you can take away some of that clutter and you can hone it down, then it's going to be more interesting and more effective because the stuff that's important is what they'll see, right? So some of you are going to love this, and some of you are going to, you know, 
But um, it's actually kind of fun to trim and shorten something. Another writing teacher called it trimming the fat, taking a piece of bacon and, and cooking it down and cooking it down until it's nice and crispy. And all this stuff that you really didn't need, that's kind of a way, and now you have this nice, crispy piece of bacon. So we're going to trim the fat. So here's this first paragraph. Really, it's just one sentence. <laughs> it's very long. Many of the believers from Calvary Chapel of Fredericksburg who were able to go on the mission trip to the country of Columba were absolutely amazed and grateful at how many of the local people they were able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with during the trip that happened in late August. Woo! That's one sentence, and that's a lot of words. But do you need all those words, right? So I've done this little exercise for you. I just started crossing out words that we really didn't need. Instead of many of the believers, you can just say many believers, right? Um, and, and a lot of times when you see this, we're able to, ooh, you don't need it. Um, the country of Columbia, don't need it. They'll figure it out from the story that it's the country. And Columbia with an O is always only the country. Absolutely amazed and grateful. Mm, it's starting to sound a little too... It was absolutely awesome and amazing, right? You, you want to, like, trim some of that stuff down so there's a serious tone and you're getting to the point. Grateful, that's a good word. At how many of the local people... Uh, I think we can figure that out. Take out of the local. Of how many people... There's that they were able to, again, right? Kill it. Share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can say that it's not wrong, but you can shorten it to share Jesus, right? Um, during the trip, we already said that they were on a trip, right? So we don't even need that. And, and uh, we just leave that it was in August. So we can take that four lines down to two. Believers from Calvary Chapel Fredericksburg were grateful for many opportunities to share Jesus in Columbia last August. You got the same information, but it's, boom, short and sweet, yes. And, and the, right reader, the, the reader can just get through it like that. Okay, got it, I'm with you. Now let's get on to the juicy stuff about the trip, right? All right, so look at exercise one. Be merciless here. Just cut stuff, just take out your pen, use it like a sword or pruning shears, and just cut as much as you can and still leave the important information. So reading our first example where we're going to trim it down, here it is in the original. Almost anyone can do their best to learn to write better and improve their writing in some way, shape, or form. Improving your writer, writing as a writer takes time, persistence, patience, and willingness to revise or reshape your written work. One must be able to see their written work from the perspective not of the writer but of the reader to understand and know with more certainty which words and phrases are absolutely essential and which are a bit unnecessary and could be cut without taking away from the depth of meaning and value in the piece of writing. So we'll have a prize for whoever can cut the most words. No, we won't have a prize. I'll give you a gold star. All right, let's take it sentence by sentence, shall we? Who would like to do the first sentence? Tom? Anyone can do, no wait, anyone can learn to write better in some way, shape, or form. Very nice. What else could we kill? Some way, shape, or form. Yeah, you could. <laughs> Yeah. Anyone can learn anyone, to write better. Anyone can improve their writing. Anyone can improve their writing. Yeah. Very good. Yes, this is the kind of merciless chopping that you need to be a good writer. All right, who would like to take the second one? I will. Okay. <laughs> Improving your writing takes time, persistence, patience, and willingness to revise or reshape written work. Okay. Who has uh, some more cuts to suggest for that one? Lindsay, go ahead. Um, improving writing takes patience and willingness. I, yeah, I cut out too much on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to cut 
<laughs> well, you <laughs> almost got it. Willingness to yeah. what? <laughs> Willingness to reshape your written work. Okay. Ronnie, what did you have for that one? Oh, I went really far. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I, I wrote, improving your writing takes time. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> yeah, but a little far. <laughs> Let me ask you this: Could persistence and patience be the same thing? Persistence is going back to it on purpose, and like that. Patience would be like, I've got to do this again. That, yeah, I guess you could say that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have a lot of descriptors there: persistence, patience, willingness to revive. We have some synonyms, or for our purposes, they're basically synonyms. So you don't need you don't need both of them, right? You don't need revise and reshape. That's the same thing. To me, persistence and patience is kind of the same thing, right? And so time and persistence would be like the same thing because you use persistence in the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. You could cut time or persistence. Yeah. Or maybe it takes patience and a willingness to revise your work. Right? And we don't need written work because we already know we're talking about writing, writing. so we could just cut out written. Yeah. Um, and some of you who really want to chop, you could just say improving your writing uh, takes patience and willingness to revise. Right? That could, we could get it down to six words or whatever that was. Okay, now we have a really long sentence. What did you guys do with it? And you can, obviously, you can break it into two sentences if you need to. I got half of it. I just put one must be able to see their written work from the perspective of the reader. And then I stop. Good. Okay, um, so let's take out written, right? Yeah. Or even you could oh, change yeah. written work to yes. writing. What about be able? Take that out. Mm -hmm. yeah. One must see yeah, one their must written see. work from, or their writing, or their work from the perspective of the reader. Yes? Yes. Lizzie took out not of the writer. Good, we don't need that. This is not a novel, right? And then what about um, the second half of that? We're talking about which words are essential to the meaning. There are two concepts there, you know, seeing it from the writer, the reader's perspective and knowing when to, what is essential to the meaning. Because you can get too crazy and cut stuff that you shouldn't be cutting. And I've seen people do that. They're just trying to shorten it, get it down to word count, but then they cut something that's actually really important. So how could we make that second half shorter? To understand which words are essential and which could be cut without taking away from the meaning. How about which words are essential and which could be cut? Cool. Oh, but I like without taking away the meaning. I like that too. Really, really good. Because that's the point. That's the gist of that second half of that sentence. It's actually hard for me to write like this now. <laughs> <laughs> it's lucky, it's lucky writing. I had to redo it several times. I'm like, no, that's not fluffy enough. All right, so we're, we're looking at page 27 now about writing style. And this is um, stuff that really could help you with just about any kind of writing that you are doing. Um, one thing to note that we already talked about was a really good book to help you with writing is called Elements of Style. It's at the very end of that first paragraph. Elements of Style by Strunk and White. So good. It just helps you think of things like getting to the point, being brief, thinking about your reader, making sure the message you wanted to convey is the message you're conveying, making your dialogue sound natural. It's just a really good, short and to the point kind of handbook on writing. Um, if you want to know journalistic style, what's being used by newspapers and magazines today, AP style guide is really good. AP means Associated Press. You can Google stuff about it too. Like if you just want to see what numbers to spell out Associated Press style, you can usually Google stuff like that. Okay, so first we're talking about general style for journalistic writing is brevity. 
as we just said, short and sweet. sweet. Short and to the point, short and sweet, yes. So we did this little exercise here where we looked at this four line sentence, many of the believers from Calvary Chapel, Fredericksburg, la 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 la, and how we can just take out some of those unnecessary phrases and get it down to a line and a half. And it's really good to write brief, not only because when you're writing for a publication, every single word you write, they're paying for the ink to print it. Think about that. Um, but also, you don't want to bog your reader down with stuff that's not the heart of the story, right? So to tell me when and where you went, I don't need four lines for that. Just tell me when and where we went, and now let's get on to the good stuff. What happened, right? So our first exercise, we were having a lot of fun. It's purposefully written in a very wordy, bloated way. So we were going through and we were chopping anything we could that we could still keep the meaning and the important points um, of that. So if, if the new people who just came want to take a stab at that, exercise one, be merciless. Cut that stuff that we don't need, just keep the meaning. So cut as much as you can and still keep the meaning. So go ahead and give it a shot. Okay, let's go over exercise one really quickly. Um, Tom, Roscoe, you had a really good revision on that one. Can you read us your revision on exercise one first sentence? Sure. Anyone can learn to write better in some way. Yeah, so we, we took it down to about half the words there, right? Even though it's common to hear the words way, shape, or form, they're really redundant, aren't they? Um, uh, Lindsay, what was your revision on the second sentence? Um, improving, improving writing. Wait, because <laughs> <laughs> I fixed it. Okay. Yeah. Improving <laughs> your writing takes patience and willingness. Uh, I think we added back to revise. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I like did something. <laughs> And actually, the messier your draft is, the better, because that means you're really thinking and looking at your piece and working on it. You don't want to be timid about revising. Revising takes courage. It takes um, a mercilessness. It takes a putting your sentimentality down. You know, when you write something, it's kind of like your baby, and you wrote every single word, and you love it just as it is. And that's good for your first draft, right? It's good for your first draft. You don't want to be thinking, what's the shortest way I can say it? It's for your first draft. You just want to get your ideas out there. You want to convey the depth and the meaning and the purpose and the heart of the Lord. So while you're writing your first draft, just generate the, the content, the truth, the message. But then step away. And some, some writers will actually put their writing away for a day or a week so that they can come back, when they come back as an editor, with fresh eyes, not so much sentimentality and personal attachment, and try to look at it as the reader and say, okay, what can I kill now, right? There's some quote about good writing means you have to kill your darlings. That sounds so <laughs> gruesome, but it's really like, you can't say every word I wrote is perfect and wonderful and precious. No, you have to go, okay, how can I shorten this? Especially as a journalist, you have to say, how can I make this so much shorter so I can squeeze in more really good stuff because that's what it's going to come down to. Either you can make the non-essential stuff shorter so that you can squeeze in more good stuff or you're just going to have sort of like a bloated piece that is not going to be as strong, right? So you really have to learn to do this as a, as a journalist. Um, okay, anybody, anybody on the last sentence, which really is kind of two sentences. Go ahead. One must be able to see their written work from the perspective to understand which words could be cut without taking away the piece of writing. Okay. Let's see. One must be able to, how about one must see their work from the perspective of the who? Reader. This is key for all writing. I don't care what your genre is, even screenwriting and poetry, right? A lot of times we think, oh, poetry is just for me. I can say whatever I want. But if you're trying to convey something. Um, and then we talked about how 
could we kill the whole rest of that sentence, or is there something there that we need? Is there something there that we need? And I think that is, um, as Charmaine kept, which words can be, let's see. Could be cut away. Could be cut. Could be cut without taking away the piece of writing. Which could be cut without taking away meaning or value. And we talked a little bit about how people either fall into two camps. They, they just, they don't even want to cut like one word. Maybe they'll cut one word in each pair. And then some people, they just start slashing, right? But you have to make sure, do I, am I keeping the important point in there? Keep the important point. Think about what do I really need to keep and then do kill everything else. But if you're not sure, don't just start slashing, right? Read it. Think about it, maybe go get a cup of coffee, come back, look at it again, you know. And it's good to be merciless, but you don't want to chop the stuff that you really want to, to stay, right? So there's a balance. And the more you do it, the easier it gets. It never gets easy, right, to edit your own stuff. It's actually easier to edit somebody else's stuff because you can be more objective. And some of those words that we, we can always take out or the we're able to's, those <laughs> just use a verb. Don't say we're able to go, just say they they went, right? Um, uh, all right, so let's look at exercise two. How could you shorten that? Take a second, read through it. If you don't get through the whole thing, that's fine, but really look at each sentence. Maybe read the whole thing first and then do some chopping. How could you shorten that? The short-term missions team was able to travel to the country of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is located in the central region of the continent of Africa. While in Congo, they held a special vacation Bible school for dozens of children in multiple villages near the major metropolitan city of Lubumbashi, a city which has a population of nearly two million people. Because of the devastation from tragedies such as AIDS and countless civil wars, the entire country of Congo has nearly 4 million orphans. It is a really sad situation. Because of this great need, the missions team traveled to several orphanages in and around Lubumbashi to bring the hope, light, and love of Jesus to these children through skits, plays, musical presentations, puppet shows, and Bible lessons. More than 200 children in the BBS and in the orphanage prayed to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior with the team during their six-day trip in war-torn Congo. Somebody want to take the first sentence? The short-term missions team was able to travel to the country of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is located in the central region of the continent of Africa. Charmaine? The missions team was able to travel to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, of the, of the continent of Africa. Nice, nice cutting. Somebody else have something different for the first? Lindsay? The missions team traveled to Congo, located in Africa. How about in Central Africa? I call yours and I see you. <laughs> okay, so we've got a lot cut out of there. Um, Jamal, did you want to share yours? The missions team traveled to the country of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Let's okay. keep that it, what's that? That's what you had. Let's keep that it's in Central Africa because how many of us Americans really are aware of the geography of Africa? It might help us just to get our footing a little bit. But we certainly, as you all saw, we don't need the continent of and all this. Um, and we don't need was able to, right? The missions team traveled to Congo, um, and it, some of you, if we'll talk about this later, but some of you might have wanted to pull that six days up into your first sentence, and that would have been fine if you wanted to do that. Okay. While in Congo, they held a special vacation Bible school for dozens of children in multiple villages near the major metropolitan city of Lubumbashi, a city which has a population of nearly two million people. How can we make that shorter and sweeter? They held a vacation Bible school for dozens of children in multiple vi <coughs> villages near Lubumbashi, a city of nearly two million people. Nice. Very good. Yeah, very nice. 
Anybody else have anything, Charmaine? They held a vacation Bible school for dozens of children of Lubumbashi. Okay, well, they're near Lubumbashi, mm -hmm. right? But these are villages near. Okay. But it's a little confusing, isn't it? Having all that information in one sentence. You got the villages, you got the city. So maybe even that needs to be trimmed a little more. You don't want to confuse your reader. I think that's one of the first rules, which I didn't even put in here. We talked about that a long time ago, not confusing your reader. Um, we want to make a sentence work and hold its weight and every word count, but we don't want to cram so much information in one sentence that the reader goes, wait, where are they? <laughs> you know, what? What's happening? Good job, everybody. Okay, next sentence. Because of the devastation from tragedies such as AIDS and countless civil wars, the entire, entire country of Congo has nearly four million orphans. And that is true, actually. How can we shorten that and keep still keep the good stuff, Jamal? Tragedies such as AIDS and civil wars has produced nearly four million orphans. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there or in the country. Yeah, very nice. You're just getting what needs to be in there. You're cutting everything else out of the way. You see that? Okay, here's the next sentence. Because of this great need, the missions team traveled to several orphanages in and around Lubumbashi to bring the hope, light, and love of Jesus to these children through skits, plays, musical presentations, puppet shows, and Bible lessons. Now, I know you see the the redundancies in that list at the end, right? Charmaine, what do you have? The missions team traveled to several or orphanages to bring the hope, light, and love of Jesus Christ to these children. Mm -hmm. Do we want to say anything about what they did or how they did it? Through Bible lessons? You could say through skits and Bible lessons. You could say through musical presentations and Bible lessons, whatever you want to say. Those first few words are kind of the same. Skits, plays, musical presentations. We don't really need all that, right? But it's nice to know that they did something on a child's level to bring that to them. So I would say keep at least one of those things and Bible lessons. Because as Christians, that's going to be super important to us. We want to know, did they bring the Bible? Did they share the gospel? What were you going to say, Jamal? I put an HMMM question mark because I didn't want to get too scissor happy. <laughs> uh, but... I figured it's, they already know it's a missions team, so I just put the team traveled to several orphanages, yes. orphanages in Lubumbashi to bring the love of Jesus Christ to these children through musical presentations and Bible lessons. Yeah. The skits and plays can kind of play into both of those. Yes. And that was it. Yeah, very nice. So read yours one more time. Uh, the team traveled to several, several orphanages in Lubumbashi to bring the love of Jesus Christ to these children through musical presentations and Bible lessons. Good. And then the last one, more than 200 children in the VBS and in the orphanage prayed to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior with the team during their six-day trip in war-torn Congo. Anyone in the back row? Mm -hmm. Kind of quiet back there. Also, yes? Mine says, just more than 200, no. <laughs> more than 200 children prayed to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. Okay, nice. And let's take, if we do that, let's take six day and put it up there in the first mm -hmm. sentence. Yeah, yeah, very good. So we could get that down to about half the words and still we have good information, things that the reader needs to know about the orphan situation, about what this team did, about how many kids got saved. We're just boiling it down, short and sweet. Okay, here's uh, another uh, 37 words in the sentence. See if you can make it 16 words or less. And if you want to, you can change one word into another. I'll give you license, you know. See if you can get it to 16 words or less. All right, who got it down to 16? Yes? I don't know how. <laughs> okay, Lindsay, hit us. Citizens of communistic Colombia are kept poor by their government, receiving just one new outfit yearly. Okay, yeah, and that's 16 words? Okay. Go ahead, Charmaine. Okay. In Colombia, citizens are kept poor by the government. Each allotted one pair of shoes, pants, and a sh one shirt to wear anything. 
Very good. And we could even take out to where, right? Mm -hmm. Some of you are say Colombia, some say Cuba. I messed up and had to change it. Doesn't matter for the purposes, right. but if you're wondering why people are saying something different than what you have, um, somebody else want to read theirs? Ronnie? Cuba's government keeps the people poor. Citizens get only one pair of pants, shoes, and shirt yearly. Very good. Very good. So if I tell you that people in Cuba are poor, that's a vague. That's kind of a big statement, right? How poor are they, right? But if I give you a fact, if I say, okay, look, they're only allowed to have one pair of pants, one pair of shoes, and one shirt every year, then you know what I mean by the word poor, right? And that the government, not only are they poor, but they're not allowed to be otherwise, right? It's kind of crazy. Um, okay, somebody else want to share or? What, I, what I've done is in Go ahead. communist Colombia people um, are kept see I, 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 this is where I got anyways uh, it's okay people are kept poor by the government each citizen is given one pair of pants of shoes and one shirt and, uh, what, what I think I've done and I, I heard it from there I boxed in what in other words I can only use these words but these guys here went outside the box yeah. and used uh, other different words to say the same thing. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's a good learning lesson. But I me. like how you kept the word communist in there yeah. because that's um, not all Americans know that that country is a communist country. Right. And so it kind of helps to describe the environment, the situation. Yeah. Okay. Good. But it's, and it's kind of fun, isn't it? I mean, if it's not your writing, it's easier to just chop stuff up. So we were talking about how there's there's all these stages of writing. Writing is not one, two, three, done. You know, it's more like sculpture, and you sort of take it and you work it and you walk away from it and you come back and you work it again. You put stuff back. You take stuff away. You work it again. You have to do it that way. That's how writing happens. Don't ever be discouraged by the amount of revision you have to do. In fact, if you just write something and turn it in without revising it, it's not your best piece of work. It's not going to be the best that it can be. So revision is writing. Writing is putting something down and then coming back and working it and working it. And revision means review. It means to see something again, to see something in a fresh way. So sometimes it's good to write it, to generate it, to get the, the big picture out there, step away, some of you for a couple hours, a couple days, a week, then come back, and now you can see it with fresh eyes. You can re-see your own piece, and that's really good. Um, so, all right, so that's brevity. Now, let's go to page 28. Clarity. What does clarity mean? Clear. There's no confusion, right? We know exactly what you're trying to say to us. Be sure that every sentence is clear to the reader, specifying who is doing what, where, how, etc. Avoid confusing wording or extremely long sentences. Avoid vague pronoun references. He, she, them. Who, who is he, she, them? And too much information in the same sentence. You'll lose people if your sentences get really, really, really long. You know, try to have one main idea for each sentence. It doesn't mean you can't have a long sentence, but just keep one main idea in each sentence. Okay. All right. So look at what is unclear in each sentence below. The team of doctors provided care for the sick children. There were about 12 of them. What is unclear in that sentence? Why are these children sick? Um, okay. And how many doctors? Uh, Twelve of who? Twelve of who? Twelve of them. Them is a vague pronoun reference, right? We could rewrite that. We just learned about brevity. So couldn't we just put the number 12 in the first part of that sentence? The team of 12 doctors provided care, or the team of doctors provided care for 12 sick children, right? And then we can just kill the rest of that, and now we know who the 12 belongs to, right? Does everybody see that? 
So maybe on your own sheet, put that 12, you know, whatever you want, if it's 12 doctors or 12 children, and then cross out the second half of that sentence. Put, move that 12. Because who's the 12? Where's the 12? You're going to lose your reader. If you lose your reader, even if that, that seems like a small detail, but it, once you lose your reader, they're going to feel sort of like they're floating around and they don't know what's happening. And then they might give up and stop reading your story. Okay, let's look at the next sentence. Now, we as Christians, we've got to be really careful with our references to the Bible, that someone who doesn't know the Bible might not have any idea who in the world is Rebecca, right? So here's the sentence. He felt like Eliezer looking for Rebecca. What's wrong with that sentence? I don't know who he is. Yes. Some people don't even know who, <laughs> who is he. Who is Eliezer? Who is Rebecca? Eliezer? Why did he feel like that? What are we even talking about, right? Now, the word Noah, probably everyone knows who Noah was, right? But Eliezer, and really, if you read that story, he doesn't have a name in that chapter, so anyway. So, El too vague. The reader, you're just going to lose them. They're going to say, who's Eliezer? I don't understand. And they're going to leave your story, right? Um, Teresa told the little girl about Jesus, and she got saved. Now, that looks like it's okay, right? But that could be taken wrong. Mm -hmm. Charmaine, be, what do you see? It could be Teresa that got saved or the little girl that got saved. Yeah. <laughs> Which she? Yeah. They're both women, so the she could refer to either one, right? Mm -hmm. Here's one. This was actually a really hard sentence. We revised this sentence so many times. Oh, my goodness. Bitty Bitty Refugee Settlement is a refugee camp in northwestern Uganda, just south of the South Sudanese border, home to more than 270,000 South Sudanese refugees fleeing the ongoing civil war and is the largest refugee settlement in the world as of 2017, where many Calvary Chapel believers have been sharing the hope of Christ. Now, that is one sentence. Did, when did I lose you? <laughs> right? Like 10,000. <laughs> We've got how many numbers in there? We have the word south. Look how many times we have the word south in there. One, two, three. Oh my goodness. Too many directional words, too many um, numbers, too much information. I'm, wow, I'm just overwhelmed. I don't want to go on with the story because I don't know what just happened, right? So we've got to break this sentence. we got to break this into more than one sentence, don't we? And is there a way around that? south of South Sudanese border and South Sudanese refugees? It's hard. It's not an easy sentence because we, we labored over this sentence for many versions. But look at it for a second and see what you could do to make even something clearer or shorter. We're looking for clarity now. Clarity means it's easy to understand, right? Anybody see at least one thing they could fix or change? Were we still slicing, or what are we doing? Trying to make it clearer. We've got way too much information in one sentence. Okay, bitty bitty refugee set of settlement is a refugee refugee camp in northwestern Uganda, home to more than two hundred seventy thousand South Sudanese refugees, where many Calvary Chapel believers have been sharing the hope of Christ. Very nice. Anybody else have a thought or see where you'd like to break things up? I'm a little slow, so I'm still kind no, of in the middle of it. But I took the second refugee word out because it said refugee settlement. So yeah. it's bitty bitty refugee settlement is a camp in northwestern Uganda, south, not just, you know, mm -hmm. but south of the south, south of the south, or south of the Sudanese border. Could you say below? Below, yeah, mm -hmm. good. And I just put not home to, but more than 2,000, 2,700 or two. Or with? Yeah. With more than? With more than 270,000 Sudanese refugees fleeing the whole civil war. That's as far as I got. Okay, mm -hmm. good. And it's hard. I, I took all the Souths out, and then our editor pointed out that South Sudan is its own country. <laughs> that there's Sudan and there's South Sudan, and I didn't know that. So it's tough. This is a tough one. That's why I put it in there. I think the Calvary Chapel believers have been sharing the hope of Christ at the Bidi Refugee Settlement below the South Sudanese border in Uganda. It's the largest um, refugee settlement in the world as of 2017 and home to more than 20, 25,000 South Sudanese refugees, including 
I can't even talk. It was supposed to clean the ongoing civil war. So you flipped it. Flipped the order. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's good. And we're going to talk about flipping in a second. I wanted to throw that at you, but then I was like, no, we'll do one concept at a time. All right, good. Let's move on to the next one. Associate Pastor Joe Smith. Remember, we want to make it clearer, not just shorter. Associate Pastor Joe Smith of Calvary Chapel Jamestown has been leading short-term missions teams to Casa de Vida, House of Life, in Mexico, directed by Ivan De Carlo for the last 12 years to work with orphans where they do building, plumbing, and feeding projects, and recently installed 700 feet of plumbing to connect water from the village to the orphanage. There is too much in that sentence, right? That's like a paragraph. So maybe put some, some uh, slash marks where you would cut cut some information. Remember, try to have one main idea per sentence. You want to talk about plumbing in one sentence. You want to talk about how many years they've been going down there. It's okay to have a couple pieces of information, but that's just too much. All right, I'm going to, let's move on so we can get all our stuff done. The next concept is active and passive voice. In active voice, the subject is completing the action of the predicate. The dog jumps the fence. It is the clearest, most straightforward, concise style of writing. Passive voice uses a linking verb, like is, was, uh, flipping the sentence so that the one doing the acting is not the subject. The fence was jumped, right? That's why passive voice is often used in legal, scientific, or medical documents, because it's it's so non-specific. Um, because active voice is more direct and clear, it is the preferred style for journalism. Passive voice, the orphans were given nearly 500 pairs of shoes. See that word were? That's a linking verb. It's unclear. Active, the teen gave nearly 500 pairs of shoes to the orphans. Who gave the shoes? All right. Passive voice. There were more than 400 people at the altar praying to receive the gospel. See that there were? That's passive. Okay? Active voice. More than 400 people came forward to receive the gospel. Who came forward? More than 400 people. We know who is doing what. It's concise. It's clear. It's active. Change each of these examples to active voice and shorten. New Jersey was devastated by Hurricane Sandy. Look at that word devastated. Who devastated what? Right? Think about that. More than $71 billion in economic damage was caused, there's your passive, was uh, in October of 2012. So how could you make that more active? What do we got? Jamal? Hurricane Sandy devastated New Jersey by causing more than $71 billion in economic damage in October of 2012. Beautiful. Boom. It's clear. Hurricane Sandy did the devastating, right? And then because he's a good reporter, he's giving you a fact $71 billion in damage. And the year, right? Okay. Next one. At an outreach in San Diego, the gospel was shared by, see that was? Making a passive. Christian skater Brian Sumner after a skating demonstration. Among the crowd of several hundred, there were, there's your passive, nearly 75 young people whose hands were raised, there's passive again, to accept Christ as Savior. Think about who's doing what here. Who is sharing the gospel? Who is raising their hands? Try to flip it around so that the subject is doing the action. Anyone? Yeah, the, the gospel was shared by a, a Christian skater Brian Sumner at an outreach in San Diego. There were nearly 75 young people except Christ's Savior. I like that. I like that last bit. Let's help him out with the first part. We don't want to have was shared by because that's passive voice. So how else could we say that? Christian skater Brian Sumner shared the gospel yeah. with a crowd of several hundred 
approached 75 young people, raised their hands, and received Christ as Savior. Good. And we could even say, um, right where you said of which there were, we can just put a colon, a semicolon, and just say 75 young people raised their hands.